Have you ever like misread someone before? Uh, they clearly said something, but you heard something else. Um, so about 15 years ago or so, I was a young father. My oldest son at the time was four, Logan. And at the time, we were in a small church community in a small church in a small town of Iowa. So a lot of smalls there. And in that small, we live in a small parsonage as well. It's just a two-bedroom kind of parsonage. We had an upstairs bedroom and a downstairs bedroom. And my wife and I stayed in the downstairs. My son, Logan, stayed in the upstairs bedroom. Anyways, so what had happened was, just like most four-year-olds, that when it's bedtime, they come up with a lot of different reasons why they shouldn't go to bed. Uh, whether they're hungry, they want some water, they have to go to the bathroom, can you read me a story? All these kind of things happen after we tell him, Logan, please go to bed. And Logan came down the steps and he's like, Dad, I need to go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom. I need something to eat. Get something to eat. Kind of whatever it is. But then as a loving father, I got to the place of saying what loving fathers do. Logan, go to bed. About three minutes later, he comes down the steps and he's like, Dad, there's something in my room. Logan, go to bed. And so he goes back upstairs into his bedroom. The next night, kind of the same rhythm happened. Came downstairs, drink, water, bathroom, all this kind of stuff, read story, all this stuff. And eventually I said, Logan, just go to bed. Please just listen to me. Go to bed. And so he goes to bed. And then about two or three minutes later, he comes down the steps again He's like, Dad, there's something in my room. It's flying around. Logan, go to bed. I'm tired of this. So the next day was my day off. I kind of slept in, and I wake up, and I think to myself, I'd love to go snuggle with my four-year-old Logan in his bed. And so I get up the steps, and I lay down next to him, and I'm waking him up, like rubbing his back and just kind of tickling him and stuff. And, and I look up, and there on the ceiling is something, and I didn't know what it was. And so I get out of bed, and I walk over there, and there's this black thing that's hanging down. And all of a sudden, I realize it's a bat, and I scream, no joke, like a six-year-old girl. I ran and grabbed my son, Logan, ran down the steps. I get a friend, and we take out this bat. My son clearly said there's something in my room, clearly said something is flying, and I thought it was something else but he clearly stated over and over again what was going on in his room. Now, Jesus has never sugarcoated anything. He always said what his purpose was, what he was going to do, who he is, that he is the son of God, that, that he was going to uh, establish his kingdom, like all of this stuff that he was going to do. But he also talked about that he was going to die, that he was going to have a, a terrible death, that he was going to rise again. He clearly stated everything, what he was about and what he was going to do. But the disciples, his closest friends, heard one thing, but thought another. And so they really thought that he was going to establish his kingdom like an earthly kingdom there in Jerusalem. And so Jesus again and again is like, no, listen to what I am saying. So today is Palm Sunday. And uh, in this message, we're going to kind of lean into some stories, kind of the week of uh, Palm Sunday, and really look at how Jesus is the humble king, that he really is the humble king. Now, Jesus begins this week with cheers and excitement as he's entering into Jerusalem. But in Luke chapter 19, it talks about how Jesus has, that he's weeping over Jerusalem, that there's tears coming down his face. And I wonder, as these cheers and as these excitement uh, of just uh, what uh, that Jesus is coming, that I wonder if everyone's like, oh, he's so excited about this new kingdom that's happening. But Jesus is weeping over the hearts of the city in Jerusalem. And so what he does, he tells his disciples, his close followers, his close friends to go grab a colt, one that's never been ridden before. And we'll pick up this story in Matthew chapter 21. It says, they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds 
that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up and saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Everyone's excited because they believe the Romans are going to be wiped out. They believe the tyranny of the Roman Empire will no longer be there. This is their excitement that this new king is coming. This revolution is going to happen. That Jesus came to Jerusalem, however, to die. And not just die, but die on a Roman cross. Jesus clearly stated again and again what he's about, but what he said and what they heard were two different things. So even from his entry, we see the humbleness of the king. Now in this age, when, when uh, someone of royalty or someone of power would, would come in, he would be riding on a horse or a, a, a beast of honor, which, which more than likely is a horse. But Jesus chooses a colt. He, he chooses just a small little foal donkey. Now, in the Old Testament, there's a prophecy by Zechariah chapter 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Your king is coming. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. Not on a horse, but on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus could have chosen a brave horse. He could have made that time about him, have everyone clamor and admire him and adore him, but he chose to come humbly because that is who Jesus is, this humble king. And we see this humility throughout today in three different places. And the first place we're going to look at is Jesus is having dinner, actually the last time he has supper with his closest friends, his closest followers, the disciples. And something interesting happens here, and we're going to pick up the story in John chapter 13. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He lay aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So the first thing that we see in, in these three different places, really in the last few hours before he is crucified, the first thing we see is Jesus is the servant king. Jesus is the servant king. In verse 3, it starts off and it says, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. He's about to have the agony of crucifixion happen to him. That he's going to stand in the place of sinners. At that moment, Jesus could have made that time about him, about them serving him because of what he's about ready to, or about what's going to happen to him. He could have made it all about himself. But what does Jesus do? He gets up. He lays aside his outer garments. He takes the towel and he wraps it around his waist. And he begins to wash the disciples' feet and wipes them. The disciples see Jesus as the conquering king. But Jesus chooses to serve. Now a little bit of history at this time. Um, in, in this ancient time, uh, there were dirt roads. There wasn't paved roads. And people wore sandals, or if they couldn't afford sandals, they walked around barefoot. And they would walk in the dirt, and the dust, and the mud, and even waste that was left over by the animals. And so when they would arrive at someone's home, just to hang out or even to eat, their feet would need to be washed because of how dirty or even how smelly it was. And especially when it was time to eat, because in, in that day, they didn't have tables similar to this one. Their tables were really low to the floor. And, and whenever they would eat, they would lean up, and at least their feet were away from the table, but the smell as well as the sight of dirty feet 
was very unpleasant. And so how it would work out is the, the lowest servant or the lowest person would honor the higher person by washing their feet. And this task shows Jesus' willingness to be a servant. Earlier, Jesus taught that the Son of Man came to be served, or it came not, excuse me, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What I find interesting is why didn't any of the disciples step up and wash his feet? Remember, they think he's the conquering king, this new king. Why didn't they just wash his feet? I believe the reason why they didn't wash his feet, because much like us, we think some things are beneath us, don't we? We can be at Walmart and we see some trash on the ground and we walk by it and we think to ourselves, you know, somebody else can pick that up or they they have people they pay to clean up, so I don't need to touch that. And the disciples, they more than likely thought this was beneath them. But Jesus serves and he serves well they even argued earlier about who is the greatest but what does jesus do he rises up he takes off the outer garments he places a towel around his waist he grabs a bowl a a basin and he fills it with water and he begins to wash the disciples feet I wonder what they thought as this king is washing their feet. I wonder if they thought, man, I really blew my opportunity. I should have, I should have done something. That this king would lower himself to wash their feet. For me, that's a king that I would follow. The one who leads by example. The creator of the universe lowers himself to wash the feet of his creation. What an amazing display of a humble king. The second place we're going to go to is shortly thereafter, Jesus needs to spend some time with his father. And so he grabs his, his friends and they head off to a garden. And in Matthew 26, it says, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me for just one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation, because the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. In this second place, we see Jesus as the submissive king. That he's the submissive king. Have you ever been filled with so much anxiety or so much fear that you're unable to move. That, that you didn't know what to do, how to do it, where to go, or what, um, what, what the feelings to describe inside of you was happening. Jesus, at this moment, was concerned. And the interesting thing is, Jesus didn't have to be concerned. Because he is fully God, he could say, you know what? We're going to do something different. We're, we're not going to go down this road where I am going to have be in so much pain and so much hurt and so much agony. I don't have to do this and chooses a different route. He could have said, this is, that's it. I have all power and all authority. And if he could use, he could have used that power for his gain, but he chooses to use it for our gain. Catch this. He says he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Jesus began to be sorrowful and troubled. Sorrowful, in this text, in the Greek, there's a word that's called adamaneo, which means torment or or, uh, uh, agony. But but it's not an outward pain. It's an inward pain. Adamaneo. 
it kind of begs the question, what was this inward pain that Jesus was feeling? I mean, was he thinking about the, the physical pain that he was about ready to, to uh, was it the physical pain that he was about ready to endure? Was it uh, when he was going to be stripped naked and beaten where his skin was going to be ripped off? Was it when he was going to be spat at and made fun of? Was it when he was going to have a crown of thorns be placed on his head? Was it when he was going to get punched? Like, like, was he thinking about the physical pain that he stands in the place for sinners, for you and for me? The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he said, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, that we might become the righteousness of God. He stood the gap. He stood in my place. I believe the reason why he has this Adam and Ao is because for the first time, He's not going to be in connection with God. He's going to be separated because where sin is, God cannot be. That's a spiritual pain that's much deeper than a physical pain. This is what Jesus is about ready to endure. And up to this point, Jesus has held his emotions in check. But now he leans to his friends and he says to them, uh, uh, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Jesus confesses his Adam and Ale and he needs his community. Have you ever been in a place that you were in so much ever, whether it was anxiety, fear, whether it was don't know what's going to happen and you're struggling in that place that you needed your community, your friends, your closest family members to be with you. Jesus is experiencing this. He's also experiencing something new, the anticipation of death. That it's right at the cusp of when this is all going to unfold and happen, and he needs his community. So he reaches for his friends to be there with them. And he prays something beautiful. He says to God, he says, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He falls on his face in sheer exhaustion and cries out to God, let this cup be removed. I want to pause here for a moment. Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully human. For us, if we know something is coming, that we're going to be suffering and pain and in torment, none of us would say, yeah, I I choose that. I want to go that route. We all would go, you know what? If there's a different way, let that way happen. And that's the point of the prayer if he might avoid it. But what I love about this prayer, it's almost like the next heartbeat, the next breath. He says, nevertheless, because God's God's way is better than our fleshly desires. And he so willingly put himself out there where he could have walked away and said, I'm not doing this, but he, he chose to do this. He has natural emotions and perfect faithfulness. Again, the apostle Paul says to the Philippians, he says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Then he returns to his friends, and what does he find his friends doing? They're sleeping. Now, at this point, they've been up, they, they had a great dinner, uh, I, they, they've been traveling and working and all this kind of stuff, and it's in the middle of the night, and there's no wonder why they're sleeping. But in his hour of need, Jesus says, I'm troubled, I need you to be with me here, and he finds them sleeping. Now, Jesus at this moment had every reason to scold them, to get after them, to rake them across the coals, to make them feel bad for their decision. But he doesn't do that. He makes a plea. But his plea wasn't for himself. It was for them. He says, watch and pray that you, 
may not enter into temptation, that you may not enter into temptation. And maybe he's talking about the temptation to fall asleep, but I think it's much deeper than that. Again, Jesus knows what's going to happen, and he also knows the fear and the anxiety that they will have, that they will want to scatter and run away. Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he also says here, the spirit is indeed willing. He knows that they want to to be there to the very end, but he also knows their flesh is weak because of what's going to happen, because of the danger around the corner. Jesus still shows his concern. For me, that's a king I would follow who leads by example. That's a king. He's willing to bear his soul, his pain, knowing exactly what is ahead of him. He's he's bearing his Adam and Neo to his community, to his friends. He he makes a plea to God, if this can cut past from me, but nevertheless, not as I will it, but as you And he finds his friends sleeping. And then he makes a plea for them in his hour of need. That's a king I would follow. Jesus then goes through a sham of a trial. He's placed on a cross to die in our place. And in the midst of all of that, he's enduring some immense Uh, persecution and immense being made fun of and teased and tormented by words. The next chapter over in Matthew 27, it says, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked him saying, he saved others, yet he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. The last thing I want us to see is Jesus is the loving king. He is the loving king. Jesus is being mocked. He's being ridiculed. He's being humiliated. He's been called a liar, a deceiver. For me, any time that I, uh, when I'm teased, even in a joking way, um, when I was younger and I would be made fun of for certain things, I wanted to prove why they're wrong and why I'm right. Jesus could have done that. He could have came off the cross. Uh, It said here, we'll go back a slide. It said here that... um, And if you come down off the cross, we will believe in you. Jesus could have done that. He had every reason and every uh, humanly reason to do this, but he chose to stay. He chose to remain on the cross because he chose love again and again and again. Being fully God, he could have come down, but he chose to remain. Because that is who he is. I want you to hear this. Because he did not save himself, he made a way to save others. Someone once said that it wasn't nails that kept him on the cross, it was love. For me, that's a king that I can follow, who leads by example. We just finished up uh, a series on Psalm 51 where uh, King David writes out this repentance to God. I believe this is the day that David was looking forward to where everything points to this moment where the king of the world is hanging on the cross for you and for me. He is the humble king who arrives in Jerusalem with tears down his face not on a horse, but on a donkey. Where he has dinner with his friends and not expecting them to serve him. But he removes the outer garments and begins to serve them by washing their feet with a towel and water. 
And then he goes to a garden and exposes his, his Adam and Nao and is so authentic. And instead of making it about him and, and, and getting after them for falling asleep, he makes a plea to his closest friends. And lastly, he endured as though he had lost, knowing what needed to be done. The author of Hebrews says this in verse 12, or verse 2 of chapter 12. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is a king I would serve, who leads by example. Jesus enters the city to bring salvation to everyone. This is my king. I'm going to release to the campus pastors. Have a great Palm Sunday, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye, guys. Hey, guys, thanks so much for hanging out with us for a couple more minutes. I want to go over the transformational moment with you. Um, is Jesus the king of your life? Is he the king of your life? As I was studying this the last couple of weeks, I, I came across a blog about Jesus, our humble king. And this is what the blogger wrote. He said, he was the royal son of God, the rightful ruler over God's kingdom. Yet Jesus did not come in glory, but in humility. He did not come as Lord to lord his authority over people, but rather to serve them, even by giving up his life for them. Is Jesus the king of your life? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for you. Thank you for your grace. And thank you for your love. Thank you for coming down to be with us, with your creation, the creator of the universe. Help us never to forget that what you have done on the cross, but also what you do in our lives every day. That you give us grace upon grace upon grace that you love so well. Help us to get to the place where we can truly say that you are the king of our life. And as we are prepping and getting closer and closer to Easter, help us or remind us to celebrate the risen king. We trust all of these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Again, have a great week and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye guys.